So how can we make our workshops work? Join me on the quest to find out how we can effectively facilitate group collaboration. My name is Miriam Hapness, and it is my mission to help you to make workshops work. Today I have Paulina Santos Alatore on the show, and we talk about a totally different set of workshops. She's a psychologist and conflict mediator and an educator, and she has worked in Mexico and Uganda, in Sweden and in Spain, and mostly on conflict prevention. So we have a conversation on how we can actually address these complicated issues in still a playful way that will create a safe space. So stay tuned to hear more about that topic. Hello, Paulina. Hello, Miriam. I am so happy to meet you here today in Ghent, in yes. Belgium. <laughs> yes. Thank exactly. you for inviting me. Thank you for coming all the way. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And I'm very excited today to talk to you about facilitating workshops on difficult topics. Yes. And actually with people who face major challenges in their life. Yes, yes, me too. And you're a conflict resolution specialist. You mm -hmm. have worked in many different countries. Yes. You are from Mexico. You worked in Uganda, yes. in Thailand. <laughs> And in five other places. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so maybe before we jump into the topic, you can give us a little bit of context. So how did you end up here in Ghent? <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me here today. And yes, as you said, um, I've been working a little bit in different places. And I feel that everything is somehow connected with everything else. And well, life brought me here to Ghent. <laughs> so um, what I did before is that I studied psychology in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I started making my way through different places, working mainly on education, on peace culture, on social psychology, directly with people. Mm. So, well, I've been doing things in, uh, in Mexico, in France, uh, in Portugal, uh -huh. in Norway, in Sweden. Then, yes, I went to Uganda, mm -hmm. recently to Thailand. And this year I was back here in Belgium. I was studying at the College of Europe. Oh, yes. wow. To do a post-master degree. Yeah, yes, to do a master in political science, uh, European politics and governance. Yeah. Yes. So what are the topics that you usually worked on when you say you worked with people in all these countries? Well, it depends. I usually work with things related to education or social development. And I do it uh, from a preventive perspective. Mm -hmm. So usually I work with people, as you said, who's facing like some challenges in their life or their environment. And um, there are different topics that I can work on. So I have worked with uh, peace culture, gender equality, human rights, mm. sense of belonging for children. It depends on which is the population I'm working I'm working within mm -hmm. which kind of objective we have in mind, which kind of goal. But yes, that and a bit of violence prevention, mm -hmm. that's something that I have done a lot in Mexico. Oh, yeah. So to what extent would you adjust the framework of your workshop to the different cultures? Because I imagine that conflict prevention in Mexico and Uganda and in France, Portugal, <laughs> quite different from <laughs> yes. each other. Yes, it is different. Something that I like to do since the very beginning is to see what people understand in every context about that. Mm -hmm. What do people think about the issue we're working on? Because we have many different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because of the things that, that we live that are surrounding us, right? So yeah, someone in Mexico might have a very different idea of what violence is or how they experience violence. Mm -hmm how someone can normalize violence or not mm -hmm. than in a different country with other laws or other, I don't know, other just other social conditions. Yeah. So, um, yeah, first of all, I like to see what people think about it, mm -hmm. if they think it's important and why and how can we address it. And would you do this before the workshop as a kind of research mm -hmm. or would you do this before the workshop interviewing the participants or in the workshop itself? A bit of both. Mm -hmm. So I, I do it before, of course. I need to see which are the statistics. I need to see which is the context, if there have been some recent event that people may have in mind in the country or somewhere around surrounding. But I also like to talk with the people who's going to participate in the mm -hmm. workshop. What do they think? 
are they aware of those things actually? Mm -hmm. Because, for example, something that has happened to me in uh, Mexico or Uganda, well, I will talk about my country, Mexico. It has sadly high levels of violence also. It has many other positive things <laughs> as well. <laughs> but there, there are different things happening. But sometimes people is not even aware of them because mm -hmm. they have other things to think about or to worry about or because they are aware of only the things that are happening in their near context. So, yeah, that's important for me to, so to have that vision. One clarifying question, then one to follow up. Yes. What brings them into the workshop? Yeah. Then if they are not aware of their problem. Yeah, I think this is very interesting for me, <laughs> but hopefully also for people who's listening <laughs> to this. In my case, I work with workshops that are organized sometimes by the government, by the municipality. Mm -hmm. So then it is um, the state who is wanting to do something as a preventive action mm -hmm. for some people in a certain area, certain context. So sometimes they are invited Sometimes they are gently invited to, <laughs> <laughs> <Gentle press. laughs> yes, yes, to follow. And there are different strategies for that. Usually not many people will like to go to a workshop mm -hmm. like that. If you just arrive to a place and you say, well, we have this workshop on violence prevention. It's like, <laughs> it, it just yeah. feels weird. You know, yeah. like, why would you like to go for that? Yeah. Why are they in inviting you to do that? Why oh, do they so think about you? Uh, yeah, you yeah. feel judged immediately. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, uh, for example, something that we have done in Mexico with different programs is that uh, we create some recreational activities. Mm -hmm. So then we work hand in hand with a Zumba class mm. and the workshop. Okay. So then people go to the Zumba class and then they attend the workshop or sometimes they have to attend the workshop to enter the Zumba class, you know, so we need to oh, okay. find different strategies, but it's all done in a preventive way. It's interesting that you mentioned the Zumba class because we are both dancers. Right? Yes. <laughs> so yesterday we danced Lindy Hop. Mm. What do you think is a trigger through dancing that would put the participants then at ease to follow such a workshop afterwards? I think dancing, as many other artistic activities, ludic activities, they have that. They have the play on it. They have something fun about it. They mm -hmm. have something that relates to movement. Mm -hmm. And mostly everybody likes those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about music, you think about dancing, mm -hmm. you think about something that it's going to be beneficial for you, that you can see it in that moment. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people uh, may think like, I'm not really totally called by this uh, workshop on gender equality, mm -hmm. because why do I need that? But I would love to go to this class of uh, Sumba or this class of carpentry or cooking class or mm -hmm. whatever. So it's important when I work to, to work hand in hand with these other activities. And would you then already address the topic of the workshop within this other activity? So for instance, when I think of gender equality and dancing, yes, we talked about leadership and fellowship in, <laughs> in Lindy Hop yesterday. And I yeah. think for every dance, it's the same. Would you reflect on that? Yes, I like a lot to put different meanings on the activities we do to reflect on them and to have, I don't know, some kind of significance for you. Mm -hmm. So it can be that, like if we are talking about if we just attended a dancing class and then we, we are reflecting on how can that be included or how can we understand certain mm -hmm. topic from something that we just experienced. If we are talking about a cooking class, then we know that there are certain instructions that we need to follow, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes following those instructions, following certain ingredients will give us the perfect recipe for something. So I just like to kind of mm -hmm. include those things that are around us and that are part of the context of the people whom I work with. Mm -hmm. So then it seems like it's part of speaking the same language. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's a nice icebreaker also to switch the topic in a smooth way. Exactly. Because then we're dancing, we're talking about it, we're slowly introducing mm -hmm. the other subject, we can just go through it, right? Yeah. Rather than say, well, okay, the Samba class was really good. Now let's sit and talk about something different. <laughs> let's talk about violence. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. And we are laughing. And still I wonder... Very often when we talk about workshops and we talk about the exercises, we try also to make them fun yes. and to create the safe space. How do you maintain the safe space mm -hmm. then when you switch the topics? Mm -hmm. And is it possible to have a fun workshop on such a difficult theme? Yeah, that will depend, of course. And it's very challenging, definitely. Also because sometimes the population I work with, it's... Um, 
moving population. So sometimes I can have 20 people coming and mm -hmm. then next week there's 15 and then the next week there are 35. So then it's very mm -hmm. open to how people want to interact with it or what they want to do. If it's uh, allow or if it's possible to make it funny because we're like touching these hard topics, yeah. right? In my case, I think yes, but because I said at the beginning, I work on the preventive side. Mm -hmm. So what I do, it's not a psychological session. This is mm -hmm. not a support group. Yeah, so then, then that will be different. So something important for me is that we are not there to name someone or to name a problem that someone is experienced. Mm -hmm. We are there to discuss about a problem that happens mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that happens in general, but no one has the tag of it, mm -hmm. then it's, it's okay. Easier. It's easier. Yeah. Then we can talk about it. Then we can make fun activities. Then we can just relax and discuss because it's the preventive side. Yeah. So it's not a resolution. It's just preventing that that may okay, happen or that that get worse or creating awareness about it. When we create awareness or in the preventive part, I imagine that you really need this aha moment mm -hmm. to really digest it, understand it, and then put it into practice in your daily life or even maybe realize what is happening in your real life that yes. you have learned in the workshop. Yes. So what would be the triggers or the exercises you use for that? It will depend if I'm working with children, if I'm working with adults, mm -hmm. if it's women, if it's a mixed group, where are we working? For example, I used to work in a rehabilitation center mm -hmm with uh, men, young men and adults who were there. And that was a very difficult context because they were locked inside. So mm -hmm. if someone had to open the door for me, then close it after I enter. We were all there in the common space mm -hmm. behind the bars. So it, it depends a lot. Are we alone? Do we have a, a common room? Mm -hmm. Are we outside? I think that is something important to say in the kind of workshops that I do or the way that I work with people. We don't re always have the creative room. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but yeah. it's important to adapt. So, for example, there's one exercise that I like to do a lot with people. I usually do it at the at the very beginning, and it's very simple. But just I do it in a sense of creating the atmosphere or creating the idea that reflecting about other things, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to talk about different things that someone may be experiencing. I mean, most likely, mm -hmm. it's something that is happening around. So what I do, it's usually we start stretching just to mm -hmm. break the tension. And I say like, oh, let's move a little bit. Uh, let's move our head from up to down. Like when we say yes, just to stretch. Because actually, there are some things in life to which we have to say yes, right? Mm. And then we just keep stretching. Let's move our head from right to left. Like when we say no, there are also some things in life that we need to say no. Mm. And then, then we just continue a little bit to move our shoulders up to down. When you make this gesture of like, oh, I actually don't know. I'm not mm -hmm. sure about it. And I said, there are some things like that, that we may not be sure. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of do this closing and it's okay to have things in our life, in our situation that we accept, that we say yes. It's very okay to have others that we say no and we mm -hmm. reject. And it's okay to not know about something. And I just leave it like that in that moment. Mm -hmm. But later on when we are working, so we have a topic, we just did an exercise or something. I can see if there's someone who has the face of being thinking about that. You know, when you're about to get mm -hmm. to that aha moment, when you're like, oh, wait. And you can see on person's <laughs> forehead that this information is happening. Then I go back to that idea that we work at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I don't name anybody. And I just say, like, just remember, it's okay to say yes or no, or it's okay to not know something. Mm -hmm. And then I see the people, it's just like, oh, that's true. Mm -hmm. It may be th that they realize that something is not going in the right direction, or that maybe they are doing something something very good uh, mm -hmm. regarding that topic. To come back to the fact that in many of the workshops that you facilitate, people are not there because they want to be there, because mm -hmm. they signed up. How do you then make sure that everyone still participates? Yes. Well, I talk with the people since the beginning, saying that uh, which is the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I told you about asking, what do we know about this topic? Mm -hmm. Is this important for us? Mm -hmm. Why? Why mm -hmm. will it be? So once I have this information from people, once they share that with others, I try to explain that it's important that what we discuss, I mean, 
stays here, we're not going to discuss anything, that it's very personal and so on, and that uh, participation is voluntary. Mm -hmm. So, of course, if everyone wants to talk, what's to contribute, it's very welcome. If someone doesn't want to, that would be totally okay. So once I kind of set the rules and set the ground for the workshop, mm -hmm. then what I do is just to try to introduce or give the room for other people. Usually they don't talk that much. And for example, in some cases, if I have a mixed group, sometimes a man will be the one speaking more mm -hmm. and women will automatically lower their voices or not participating. And that's a cultural thing mm -hmm. in some countries, not in all of them, but in some countries it is. So then I will try just to, to address a question specifically to some participant that I see that has, that it's reflecting, that has something to say, but maybe feels a little bit shy and say, like, well, that's interesting. What about you? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Do you have a, an example about it? Yeah. Uh, is there something that has happened to you? And what I've noticed is that sometimes when you give the word to those shy people or who's kind of willing to talk but haven't found the moment to speak aloud, then other people feel motivated to do mm. it as well. Or sometimes what I do, it's reflecting on what they are saying and kind of think aloud and say like, oh, yeah, that's true. It actually has happened to me or it happened somewhere where I was living background i'm also coming from a challenging environment if i can say mm -hmm. that in mexico so it's um i have lived in uh, similar situations or mm -hmm. similar environments so i feel i can relate a little bit more mm -hmm. when the people where i work with them yeah. so if i if i can say like oh yeah true i remember this little thing it opens the floor for other people mm -hmm. to also share their experiences or just share what they are thinking in that moment and then we can go on with the exercise so you walk the talk By leading by example and yes. opening up yourself. Yes, yes. It kind of makes me think of a topic like domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Would you have a workshop, a mixed workshop on domestic violence with men and women in the same room? No. What I have worked before is that we have worked on preventing violence in the family. But um, we address it for families of students who were in uh, high school. Mm -hmm. So we invited their parents, yes, uh, and we, we work separately. So we work with the, with the students mm -hmm. in one room, we work with the parents in other room. So in that case, it was mixed. Mm -hmm. But we try to work that based on communication. Mm -hmm. So how do we communicate with others? Mm -hmm. So maybe the title was not violence, mm. because then that would be a little bit <laughs> yeah. judging, you know? Yeah. Let me invite you to this workshop. <laughs> so it was managed on how should we communicate mm -hmm. to have eff effective uh, interactions mm -hmm. with others? How could we communicate better with our partner and with our children? And in this case, for example, we were using the fact that their children were studying, they all have something in common. Mm -hmm. Their children were studying high school. So we were talking about like, hmm, Well, it's very challenging to have like a teenager now in the house. Mm -hmm. This may bring up some different discussions. How can we address those kind of things? And then during the exercises, then it was able to start putting some things about gender equality. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, really, should it be only the mother who, who does that, oh. who has a different experience? Mm -hmm. And then someone has. Because, yeah. because people, I think that nobody is just a, or the world is not just black and white, right? Mm -hmm. like, there's not extremes. No, yeah. we all have a little bit of, of everything. So people can relate to other experiences and think and, uh, and tell you what they are, mm. they are uh, doing in that sense. So what I hear is that you wouldn't, if you have a workshop on a difficult, challenging topic, you mm -hmm. wouldn't just put it out there and talk about this immediately, but rather find a back door <laughs> and to relate it to it. Yes, yeah. yes. So let's start with other things that are part of the solution. Mm. Let's call yeah. it rather than the problem, right? Yeah. Let's work with those other things that create this uh, yeah. mountain that at the end we're going to work yeah. together or to climb together. And you mentioned exercises for learning better communication. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example? Well, we talk um, with people in... In Mexico and uh, in Uganda, I've, I've done that as well. So how do you address the other person? How you express your needs clearly mm -hmm. and try not to just think beforehand that someone gives you mm -hmm. the answer, right? So, <laughs> so we try to put different examples. We make, for example, a um, sketch. So we mm -hmm. ask some volunteers and try to tell them to ask for something they want, but without saying 
what what they really want, just trying to the other person will understand them. Because sometimes that happens to to many of us, including <laughs> totally, myself. Totally, yes. <laughs> I'm like, it's so obvious yeah. that I need this or that my intention is that. But actually, it's not that obvious for the yeah. others, yeah. <laughs> right? And in the case of um, domestic violence, sometimes it has a lot to do with it. So sometimes in Mexico, I will... This may be very different in different countries. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I'm, I'm talking about Mexico. Sometimes if you have one idea in mind, but you don't communicate it clearly, and then you're very angry because the other person did not do what you expect them mm -hmm. to do, this might lead to uh, certain episodes of violence. It's not the only reason, of course, mm -hmm. but we have seen that it's one of the triggers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it relates to... A lot of conflicts we have in families, even mm. if they don't culminate in violence, mm -hmm. but a lot of misunderstandings just <laughs> yes. start because we assume that the people close to us can read our minds, but actually <laughs> yes. they cannot. We kind of think that uh, everyone sees the world in the same way that we're seeing, yes. or everyone is thinking about the same kind of thing, yeah. but no. How do you raise the awareness or this empathy actually for at the points of view? From other people. Mm -hmm. Well, something I like to work a lot is uh, which kind of privileges we mm -hmm. have. And this might be a little bit uh, challenging when we are talking about environments that face certain risk or etc. But still, I like to raise the point and say, which are privileges, like which are good things, what is happening that has mm -hmm. good for us that other people don't have, than other people that we know, yeah, that can be around us or can be in a mm -hmm. near, a little bit close or far context and once we start thinking about that i think it's a little bit more easier i will say at least to reflect on that other person may not have the same situations mm -hmm. as we do and i think it's about connecting uh, with the heart of other people okay. so as, as soon as you start seeing others and the challenges that they may face mm -hmm. about something well it just feels so that can be one of the things Another one is when we are talking together about something, if I see that someone is going a little bit more personal, if someone is giving quite a fun example, sometimes I need to balance how much could that person or should that person keep on going. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's not a therapy session mm -hmm. and it will not be ethical to open something that you cannot close in that moment. That's right? a so, very good point. Yeah, yeah. So then I, I always need to balance how much should the person keep on talking that issue that may be a, a bit difficult for them. And then when it's the right moment to stop that comment or to, to give some kind of conclusion, I do it. And then I like to reflect with the others on how brave maybe is that person for mm -hmm. sharing that part of their of their experience, of their life. I try to say how I felt. Mm -hmm. Right, I felt um, I don't know very identified, or I I actually felt sad that this person had experienced this or other. And I say the question to the air: Maybe you can think a little bit about yourself. How did you feel with that story? Mm -hmm. I always use touching, just because that's <laughs> a very Latin thing. But uh, I say that maybe can you put your hand on your heart a little bit and try to listen? Mm -hmm. What is in there? What happened? Did it move something or not? And just have a nice thought for that person in your head. If later someone feels like saying it, that would be okay. So it, it will depend, but um, mm. I try to connect from heart to heart to others. Yeah, and also to help the participants to connect to their own feelings. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's something we often get disconnected from. Yes. How do I actually feel? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Especially because of this idea that there are good feelings and bad feelings. Mm. So then... Some people might think it's not okay if I feel this way. Yeah, This immediately, of course, brings Vipassana to my mind. Yes. We both went to Vipassana retreat. Yes, yes. So this meditation retreat where it's all about observing feelings without judging them. So they're not good or bad feelings. They're not good or bad thoughts. Yes. Would you use something like meditation in your workshops? Yes, I do some breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. Because that's the base of everything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we all know, for example, for anxiety, it's the best thing or the first thing that you need to start doing every time that you feel anxious. Mm -hmm. Just need to start breathing, <laughs> calm down, <laughs> change the focus a little bit, yeah. right? So yes, we do some guided meditation about something we want. So we teach the technique. And 
kind of try to work together with the people on how this may be helpful mm -hmm. and how this it's actually something that we can do on our own. Mm -hmm. It does not require to pay something, to buy something. It's a resource that we have inside of us, yeah. right? So everyone can access it at any moment and at any time. So we, we usually do that. We also teach people how to relax by doing the opposite. You know, when you like just press uh, something very hard mm -hmm. and then you need to release, mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. It just feels so good. And then that's okay. So you can you can use different strategies mm -hmm. to release a bit of that tension and breathe together with it. And to learn small hacks on how to deal with the daily tension and anxiety. Yes. Before we continue the show, let me take a brief moment to thank our sponsor Session Lab. Are you using Excel or Word to prepare and schedule your workshops? Try something that is designed for facilitators. With an easy-to-use drag-and-drop agenda builder, Session Lab allows you to be free and creative in your workshop process design. Session Lab also comes with an immense built-in library of workshop activities and facilitation techniques to help you to find new inspiration for your sessions. Stop messing with spreadsheets and focus on designing engaging workshops. Try it as sessionlab.com. I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't believe in its value myself. When I think of all these different exercises and also maybe the playful part of the mm -hmm. exercise to address these difficult topics, yes. I think of cultural differences. Yes. So for instance, when I think of my time in Vietnam, what I really liked about the people there were their playfulness. <laughs> yes. so I, I used to say that the Vietnamese, sometimes I had the impression it's a population that got stuck in puberty. <laughs> Because <laughs> even at age 40, they would kind of make jokes and laugh a lot and mm -hmm. be a little bit yeah, childish almost, childish. but in a positive way. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine that with this kind of cultural background, yes. um, it is easier to approach topics and also to break the tension in the room before addressing. Yes. I can also imagine that it's very different in Europe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So what are your thoughts on that and how would you use a different strategy in Europe? Yes, it, it is very different. <laughs> it's very different because of the way that we learn how to interact with others. Mm -hmm. If it's okay to make lots of jokes or not, are we more serious than others or not? What I have done in Europe, I have worked with Roma children mm -hmm. um, in France, and I have worked with uh, asylum seekers in Sweden mm -hmm. and uh, people uh, in a um, mental institution in Sweden as well. So. The people I usually work, it's, they have a different situation or, yeah, I, I would mm -hmm. call it that a different situation that, uh, that people in general that may be in, in another kind of workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes in the case of a Sweden asylum seeker, they're coming from a different country, mm. right? So they're coming from a different country, went through lots of experiences, and now they are in a different environment with other rules, with other ways of interaction, mm -hmm. etc. It is different. But I think what I said at the beginning, people always relate to the things that make you feel good or laugh in a mm -hmm. short moment. So there's always some kind of music, some kind of exercise, something that can connect you with the present moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and then then that it's okay. Then I, that's somehow a little bit universal. Yes, people in Uganda will dance way more than someone in <laughs> Europe, definitely. And they they're awesome at dancing. I mean, yeah. that's <laughs> not even a thing. But still, there will be something that a person in a, let's say, more, well, in a different country, <laughs> let's mm. call it like that, will relate. They, if we are doing an ice breaking that involves some music, mm -hmm. at some point they will interact at a different levels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it will break the ice. That That's yeah, the idea. Yeah. So what is your favorite exercise? Oh. <laughs> it depends. It's the one that I was telling you of saying yes, no, I don't know, mm -hmm. the different things. Something that I really like to work with children, it's when we have different cards with um, activities or objects printed in each of them. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, some signs on the wall saying men and women. Mm -hmm. And then each of them needs to go and paste their card in the place where they think it belongs. So it's something that belongs to women, if it's something that belongs to men, mm -hmm. or if it's something that goes in the middle. 
right? So like, what is an example for an object that you would have in this game? We have, for example, a purse, we have a phone, we have a blender, mm -hmm. we have a car, mm -hmm. for example. And I love working with children because they just go with the exercise. They don't think, they don't overthink about <laughs> like, oh, maybe if I paste it here, someone will assume judge. that I'm <laughs> judging. No, they just go like, okay, it's a car. It should be for this person or it should yeah. be in the middle. So it's very interesting to see first what they do and nobody's allowed to ask any questions. We just go paste our object. It's very funny. Mm -hmm. With children, sometimes it's like we need to find a card and we need to go and run and paste it where yeah. it belongs. <laughs> so it, it's part of the game. And then it comes the uh, reflection part, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this is interesting. Why do you think uh, we paste it here? Why do you think we paste it some, somewhere there? And then what we do, what I do, it's that I change the labels. So I take the card that said woman and I take the card that said man and mm, uh, switch put, I switch a place. And the first reaction is like, oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> impossible. And I'm like, yeah, really? So I start first talking about, about myself. It's like, hmm, a car, car for man. But actually my mom drives, mm -hmm. you know, just, just something very small. And then there's the child said like, yeah. My mom also drives. And nice. especially when you work with children, they love sharing their stories. Mm -hmm. Then someone is like, I also have an aunt who has a taxi. <laughs> <laughs> And that's a small thing, but it works. A baby. Mm. It's a baby. Where does the baby go? Who, who should take care of the baby? And like this, we are kind of touching upon um, this gender equality. Who should do each kind of things? If we are talking about violence prevention, for example, and then I'd like also to have different magazines on the floor. Mm -hmm. So we select some pictures that represent what we understand as peace, what we understand as violence. Mm -hmm. So we, sometimes I like to work with things that can have a meaning for mm -hmm. you and that can represent you. It's easier to, to talk through an object sometimes. Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you think can adults learn from children? <laughs> what did you learn from the children that you can apply to help adults first of all n not overthinking <laughs> <laughs> still working on that yeah. yes yes that's a very good <laughs> skill that children naturally have to help the others children are very good at really listening what a other of your classmates or person in the group is saying and connect with them immediately mm. It may not seem that obvious because also children seem very distracted. They mm -hmm. like looking everywhere and start playing with something they have in their hands, but they can actually connect very easily with others. So that's something that I will say. And I have worked a lot with uh, children in preschool or children of a young age. And I see that some of the activities that we consider so normal and obvious for children work perfectly when we work with adults. Things so simple as just having different colors and uh, blank paper because you can start doing your own things. It's a little bit challenging at the beginning because as adults, mm -hmm. we are not supposed to waste our time in these childish things. Mm -hmm. But once people start getting into the activity, once they get some praise of what they are doing, they love it. And it is many companies around the world are using Lego and are using mm -hmm. some other objects, Play-Doh, etc., Uh, design thinking to create mm -hmm. your own projects with something that you can touch and interact. Yeah. yeah. So I think that all the part that involves using your hands in something creative mm -hmm. can help you to work with this. And I would be curious because as far as I know, you also worked on leadership workshops. Yes. So the total opposite. Yes. Basically, <laughs> where it's uh, different challenges. <laughs> it's rather the situation you know. <laughs> that is challenging than the person that is yes, yes. Uh, in a challenging situation. What did you learn from your workshops working with people at risk mm -hmm. about the workshops working with leaders and managers? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's different population. It's a different context. As you just said, some people, they are going to work that workshop because they want to, mm -hmm. because they assume it has something that they want, just, just like that. Mm. Some other people are going there because there's a Sumba class before, <laughs> <laughs> before it, right? Yeah. yeah. So then the situation is different. Many times also the background of the people is different. Mm. Mm. Some people have attended, have already degrees and have attended different other trainings. Some people may, may not know how to read and write. In mm. other in other contexts, 
I think that what I learn or something that I can see in common is that when you can do a workshop or when you can do an activity where people can feel connected to it, when mm. people can see the value of it, it creates some sort of partnership among mm -hmm. them. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so you bond with others and it doesn't matter which kind of subject we are addressing. If people is involved in the activity, they will bond with their group. Mm -hmm. And that kind of bond can be very, very important, very peculiar to do some other things later. Mm. Yeah. What is the difference in your way of starting a workshop when you work with on a leadership topic, for instance? Yes. On a leadership topic, usually I have more people who talk more. Mm -hmm. Well, they're leaders already, <laughs> right? <laughs> they love talking, they mm -hmm. love uh, expressing, and that's perfect, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. But it would be the opposite to what I have in some yeah. in some other workshops. So whether in the risk environments and etc., I'm trying to encourage people to participate, mm -hmm. encourage people to talk. Here, what I try to do, it's to select the, the ideas that we want to put on the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So then we all have the opportunity to participate mm -hmm. and to work on how we structure those comments. So there will be exercise more directed to be more concrete mm -hmm. to be like uh, we're thinking of this of something we're thinking fast but then we put only three words uh, on mm -hmm. the table we're going to discuss with these three ones okay uh, what do you think one two three okay next one mm -hmm. so it's it's a little bit more um, dynamic mm -hmm. in, in this sense it of course depends on the group and which are their needs but i will say that's one of the main differences interesting like that <laughs> How to be more concrete and say <laughs> say more and fewer words. <laughs> yes. Or what's exactly what you want to address, yeah. right? What do you want to talk about? What's your main idea? This reminds me back to what you said about being specific in our communication. Yes. How to avoid misunderstanding, <laughs> how to give clear instructions, yes, yes, set yes. expectations. In from your experience, what makes workshops fail? <laughs> Probably one of the main things it's uh If you did not plan, mm -hmm. uh, in my experience, it's, it's that if I did not plan well enough, that would be a risk uh, for the workshop. If I don't have a plan B mm. on some exercise, oh, in all of exercise, actually, <laughs> <laughs> I tend to think a lot on how I want the workshop to go, what mm -hmm. I want to happen, what I'm expecting, and which are the things that may go wrong, actually. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's okay. I mean, sometimes you just adapt and go with it. And at the end, you reach the same result. That's fantastic. But sometimes if I don't have a backup exercise, mm -hmm. it may just kind of fade the thing that I was building. Mm -hmm. So I will say planning. Planning is important. And it's interesting. I like the idea of having a plan B. And now I'm curious, what would be the moment that you realize, oh, now I need the plan B? <laughs> When I see that people is not engaging anymore. Mm -hmm. So if someone starts looking at the window and some other person maybe looking at their phones mm -hmm. and two other people start talking about themselves and laughing about something and someone is trying to give their point. So people is not connecting anymore. Mm -hmm. I'd lost them. Yeah. <laughs> They're somewhere else. Yeah. Yes. So when I, when I start detecting some signs of that, mm -hmm. then that's the moment to change the exercise or to ask them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just important to bring the attention back. When someone asks you, are, are you still here? Is this still interesting for you? Um, mm -hmm. Do we need maybe a five minutes break or something? How do you bring them back then into mentally into the room? Well, it depends. Like sometimes we can do some kind of refreshing activity that involves movement again. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that connects you very fast. Sometimes we can do some breathing exercises. So that's, we all were doing it together. Sometimes some playful activity, just to, that it's um, related to the whole group. Mm -hmm. So we are we have the attention back, and once you see the attention is again rising in on its peak, then you change the activity back to to what you wanted, yeah. right? Because it's <laughs> it's not a game session. <laughs> It, that's always fun, but uh, yeah. but that's I think one of the strategies yeah. to do. And um. There was something that I was telling you about yesterday mm -hmm. that I thought that was, that was very important. I forgot to mention it before with the uh, risk, um, when we were working in risky topics yes. or difficult topics. This was not one of my workshops, but it was a workshop that I attended. Mm -hmm. And I have only seen it there, but I thought it was a fantastic strategy. So there was this association 
giving some workshops on how to work with people who's at the end of their life. Mm-hmm. So how should you work with them, with the family? It's not an easy topic, mm-hmm. right? Like nobody really likes yeah. to <laughs> face to, death. To face yeah. exactly that, etc. So we had plenary sessions when we were all there, but we were also having different small group exercise in different classroom. And what this organization did is that they hired two professional clowns that were there taking notes. They mm-hmm. were participating, mm-hmm. but also taking notes. And at the end of every day, they will do some sketch <laughs> about what we experience yeah. during the day, during the activities. Not with the sense of make fun of it. This mm-hmm. was in Spain, by the way. Mm-hmm. Also, the culture is important, yeah. right? Like <laughs> yeah, Spain is it's a, it's a country where you can be more playful about mm-hmm. things. You, you're more loud about uh, the things yeah. that, that you like and you want to say. So they were making some sketches about the things we experienced, which is some words that were very characteristic in yeah. one of the classes or some something that happened that everyone will remember. Yeah. And it's this kind of things that makes you close the day with a with this happy feeling that you were there. Yeah, you were part of it. Of course, you were touching on very different topics. But because you're learning and because you want to do something good for others. Yeah, and I think the just the laugh will release so much of the stress and tension. Yes. And then yes. it will show you the mirror. Yes. And when you hear it by someone else saying, maybe it's you realize that, okay, it is a burden and it is a challenging situation, but you cannot change it. So Yeah, what, what do you do to make the best out of yeah. it? How do you work with it together? Yeah. Mm. In an earlier episode, I... I interviewed a clown. Ah, see. <laughs> Steph, Steph the clown. And that was very interesting because we have so different ideas of a clown. As you mm-hmm. said, the role in the workshop you mentioned was not to make fun of the people, but rather no. to reflect, to hold the mirror, but in a kind of humorous way. Yes, yes. I think we often underestimate the impact of a clown. The impact of, of laugh in yeah, general, yeah. right? Did the participant were aware that these were clowns taking notes or did they hide as participants? Uh, no, no, no. They told us since okay. the beginning. So, uh, yeah, they, they said they will be part of it. They were taking part in the mm-hmm. in the activities, dressed as uh, all of us. And yeah. they were not <laughs> dressing. <laughs> not with the wet nose. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> not dressed as all, as all of us, but we will know that, yeah. uh, that they were there. And we will know that they will just be observing, mm-hmm. participating in some of the activities, but they will reflect some of them at the end. And at some point it was very interesting because we want them to be there. We want them to see what we yeah. were talking about because we wanted to know how they will transform mm-hmm. it yeah. into the end of the session, closing up. And I think that it's even a strategy that you could use for less hairy mm. or tough workshops. Yes. When I imagine a strategy workshop, a leadership summit, where you have a humorous reflection at the end, I can see so much benefit because then it's also a conversation trigger when the leaders then go to dinner or networking or whatsoever, then they will remember better the highlights of the conference or the summit or the workshop because of these laughs and because how this outsider reflected on it. Yeah, definitely. If you laugh about something, it, it will get imprinted. Yes, that's <laughs> you, how we or, remember. If you, or if you cry about something, yes. of course. Yeah. yeah, but well, maybe rather laugh about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this clown thing, I think it was fantastic. I mean, I was part of it as a participant and I thought it was such a great idea. And mm. yeah, it can be implemented in some other workshops. And maybe not, I mean, you cannot always hire a professional clown. Yeah. Maybe yeah. yes, that would be amazing. <laughs> but you don't know. But I was thinking, how can you make it part of your of your workshops, of mm-hmm. your ideas? And I'm sure there's many people who can have uh, awesome ideas, but I came uh, with one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was thinking that maybe at the end of the session, we can check out with the participants, which were the highlights of the day, mm-hmm. which things did they like, and etc. And that is good, because that helps you to summarize what happened mm-hmm. in the day. But if you do it, I don't know, like every, every day, etc., not everyone may participate, mm. but what if, for example, we ask a group of three or four participants to make a sketch about something that happened mm. in the day, or if we ask some others to represent without talking <laughs> a very important, uh, something in the day, a, very, a part of the workshop, a part yeah. of the class, and then the others needs to find out 
which part they're representing. So something that it's playful, mm -hmm. something that just people feel involved with. And of course, if you don't find out which one is it, that's even better. Because then you're just thinking, is it this part? No. Is it the one in the middle? No. Is it when we talk about that other thing? True. And by that, you just reflect on the day. Yeah. And it also helps you as a facilitator to see what people is thinking it's the, yeah. the most relevant part yeah. for them. And I think the exaggeration. So by asking or pushing the participants to really exaggerate, yes. to use humor, yes. to reflect on certain situations or the highlights or lowlights of the day. It will yeah. release the tension. It will stick to the memory because it makes them laugh. Yeah. And then remember the outcomes of the workshop much better. Definitely. Because very often in, at the end of a workshop, the beginning and the outcomes and discussions <laughs> we had in the morning just seem so far away. Yes. Yes, exactly. Because so many things happen yeah. during the day. And some of them are, just, they just stay with you. And some others, you may not remember them as very important. Mm -hmm. But when someone else mentioned, you're like, actually, it's true. I also felt very connected to that. And you know, now that you mentioned about making something bigger, exaggerating, mm -hmm. yeah, it reminds me of my drama classes. <laughs> I used to attend those and you are doing improv mm -hmm. as well. And one exercise that I love, it was exaggerating. Mm -hmm. So we needed to pick up one action and just keep on exaggerating it. So everyone had to pass to continue the same action. For example, just taking, imagining taking spoon and eat some soup. And mm -hmm. the next person needed to take like a bigger spoon and open more. Than one. <laughs> and the next person had to take like a huge spoon and open and their mouth. And a bucket. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And everyone just, just do it. And it's so much fun. Everyone's laughing. Mm -hmm. What if we do the same with something that happened in the workshop? Yeah. And we're just exaggerating it because it's just about like remembering it in a fun way. Yeah. As I'm sure there are many different ideas that people can. That's brilliant food with. for thought. Yes. <laughs> Very nice. So what do you think? Yes. Someone can tell us what they think yeah. about that. Yeah. I just remember we were together in the summer school. I mm -hmm. mean, I was a participant there. And we had Nolt at the end who delivered speech yes. on behalf of all the students. Yeah. I personally loved his speech yes. because it had so many funny things that happened. Or that he he said them in a such a funny way that we were all laughing about it. Yes. And those things were references to the situations that we lived during those 10 days. And he related it to a personal situation of his own. So yes. this was another kind of hook yes. for us to remember and to reflect and also to use the results or the outcomes of the summer school to reflect on our own personal situations. Exactly. And it gave a message. I mean, it, yes. it was not only laughing, but it gave a message to through something that we all put attention to. Yeah. We, all, all the people that we were listening to what he was saying. Yes. So yes, I think I think humor is a very important part and it can be used uh, as a very good strategy without making fun of people. That's very important. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Because just using humor does not mean mm. making fun. Yes. And I will take this idea of how to close in a humorous way and reflecting on the outcomes. Mm -hmm. I think that's very valuable. So how would you, if someone started the podcast <laughs> and then fell asleep <laughs> and just woke up and like what clown did they talk humor? about humor they were just talking about were... violence prevention i thought they would talk about violence prevention mm, yeah. what do you want a listener to remember from our conversation i will say that it's very important to know who you're working with and to listen to what they have to say before you you start that it's okay to work with difficult topics and it's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually necessary to work with difficult topics. And it doesn't mean that you cannot do fun activities with it. It actually can be a very good strategy to release part of the tension and to make people more aware of some other situations without falling into a victim label or like, oh, something bad that you put on them. No, let's just address the situation in general, mm -hmm. that it's also important which kind of activity are you doing, if it's a preventive or if it's a resolution, mm -hmm. then that's a, that, that will be a, a different a different way. And that there are many things that we can learn from children, mm -hmm. which is their playfulness, their love for doing things with their hands, crafts, and that also arts can be beneficial when we are working with all kind of population, right? Yeah. But if someone is working in... Um, risky topics or difficult topics, 
I would say give it a try to play a little bit with the mm. things around. Plan a lot <laughs> and go for it, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing for this conversation, all these mm. insights from a very different perspective. Thank I'm glad you. glad we had that. If someone wants to reach out to you and wants to deepen the conversation or needs your needs to pick your brain, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. you you will leave next <laughs> month back to Thailand. Back to Thailand. We will yes. miss you here in Europe. I will miss all of you, but I'll be available in Thailand. You can all visit yes. me <laughs> and Skype. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So how can people best reach out to you? By email, by LinkedIn. Yes. Should I? Yeah, I will put your LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> Paulina yes. Santos Alatore. Exactly. I will put the link in the show notes. Yes. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you, Miriam, very much. Thank you. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.